Number 12, Team C took the infamous John Turner. <laughs> Uh, just terrapins? I mean, yeah, well, well, what's with this? Whatever use. Thank no, you. Right. Not spotted turtles. Oh, yeah. I wanted to start off by saying, please, to follow up what Louise had mentioned, um, please take the time to communicate to Joe Biden about your support for designating uh, Plum Island as a national monument. We've been working so hard. We've been working so hard on this for way too long, and uh, we, we think that uh, there's a, a real good likelihood that that could be um, achieved, but it'll be enhanced if we can get your support. Um, anyway, so what I wanted to talk about is just uh, uh, three topics. Um, I realize I've got a very difficult task. I've got the worst time slot separating you from happy hour. So I'll try to be <clears throat> relatively, yeah, and, and Allison, look at that smile on her face. She can't wait for the beer um, to uh, run through just a, a couple of uh, topics that uh, CTUC has been actively involved in um, over the past couple of years, often in partnership with a lot of individuals in this room. Um, and the first one is uh, uh, vernal pools. So I think you know what vernal pools are. If you don't, they're basically small wetlands often round, sometimes oval, seasonal in nature, although sometimes they'll hold the water throughout the year. And uh, because they uh, are seasonal, they often do dry out, particularly later in the summer, you know, once trees totally leaf out and draw down the water table through uh, evaporation, uh, evapotranspiration, uh, they do dry out. And because they dry out, they can not sustain fish, and since they don't sustain fish, they could be really important breeding sites for a host of amphibian species, including some obligate species, like that cute little fella in the lower right-hand corner there, which is uh, one of the four native mole salamanders that we have on Long Island. Uh, I don't know why it gets this name, but it's called a spotted salamander. Uh, but, um, and we also have, of course, eastern tiger, uh, marbled, um, blue spotted, and then four other species that don't typically use vernal pools. <clears throat> so when we started focusing on, on vernal pool conservation and trying to learn more about that, um, where they are located on, on the island, because we realized they're really very special, uh, kind of discrete, localized natural communities, we thought we'd establish a working group, involved a number of individuals with expertise. Uh, Damon, do you want to wave? Damon Oscarson's played a key role in that, uh, in that effort, and a bunch of, again, other people. Joe is very, very uh, involved, been involved in it as well, Joe Jansen. And so we created this working group to try to just guide uh, the work of, uh, of, of guarding vernal pool delineation and, and conservation. We mapped, started the yeoman's effort of mapping uh, where the vernal pools are, because that's kind of pretty important. If you want to try to protect vernal pools, you need to know where they are. So we have done that. Um, so we've put on hiking boots and hip waders and chest waders and have just covered Long Island. Um, many times at night out in the Pine Barrens, just wonderful experiences uh, identifying vernal pools that exist uh, throughout the, uh, the length and, and width of Long Island. And it's pretty impressive th to find that many vernal pools that do exist. And they really do vary in consistency. Something like Camps Pond, which is out on the South Fork, kind of the marina area of the South Fork, which is just a remarkable kettle hole basin with uh, ponds to other ones that are smaller and linear. There's one in Caleb Smith State Park in Spittown that is just spectacular. <laughs> if you're interested, into uh, vernal pools. So anyway, we mapped all the uh, vernal pools. We w went ahead and, and ground truth, took photos of them, and all this information is available that you can, you can see on our website. <clears throat> and then what we are doing now is we've just wrapped up writing a uh, landowner's guide to vernal pool protection and, and management. The hope being that uh, those vernal pools that are on private property will uh, be more 
adequately protected if those private property owners realize the, the little treasure that they have on their property and are uh, interested in uh, taking steps to, to protect that. And that, that landowner's guide is uh, uh, available to, uh, to take a look at very, very soon. Um, it will be going to the printer, I hope, ne Ariel, next week, right? Yeah, good, right. It'll be going to the printer uh, next week. It's, what, about 24, 32 pages? I forget exactly what we wrote, but um, it, it, it'll be pretty definitive. So you're interested in Vernal Pool um, management, I'd encourage you in a, just a little while to take a look at the, uh, the landowner's guide as it'll be available online. <clears throat> there you go. So that's what it looks like. And it talks a bit about vernal pool biology and ecology, talks about the, the different species. Again, you can basically think of vernal pools having obligate species. Those are things like wood frogs, spotted salamanders, fairy shrimp, a whole bunch of other invertebrates. And then what we call facultative species, which can include things like spotted turtles and uh, uh, you know red spotted newts. Uh, there is a whole provision in it about do's and don'ts. Again, if you're a property owner, either a public uh, entity, could be a park, as well as a, uh, again, a private uh, property owner, uh, things you want to think about if you want to protect vernal pools and, and the uh, amphibian species that are dependent up, upon them. For example, you don't want to, uh, in the middle of summer, if you got a Labrador retriever, just let it run around mucking up the pond, um, or not, not even in the middle of summer, I mean early summer, late spring, because they could obviously very easily dislodge the egg masses from uh, branches that are in the water. If you happen to have a house <clears throat> with a, a, a window basements and you got the little window wells, this is something that's a, a common problem throughout New England. Uh, you don't want to uh, keep that like that because they could be death traps for salamanders and frogs. And I know this per uh, personally because I got a, a phone call last year from uh, somebody that had an eastern tiger salamander that fell into the window well in Ridge. This was a mile away from the pond that it, it likely used. But uh, if it, we recommend is to put protective plastic coverings over the, your window wells, things like that. Anyway, do's and don'ts. <clears throat> Shifting to uh, diamondback terrapins, uh, it's another iconic species. It's one that you're, you may be familiar with. It really inhabits the kind of brackish waters of Long Island. Uh, sheltered embayments, salt marshes, mud flats uh, along the South Shore and North Shore. Uh, pick particularly robust populations still al along the North Shore, really in the Nisiquag River system, Stony Brook Harbor, the whole Setauket Harbor, Conscience Bay, Port Chef Harbor Complex, Mount Sinai Harbor, and of course in many places along the, the Great South Bay. Uh, terrapins are <coughs> uh, affected by a, a lot of human activities almost all for the worst. And to try to address this issue in a systematic way, just like I mentioned with the Vernal Pool Working Group, we've established the Diamondback Terrapin Working Group. It really follows the model that, uh, again, Enrico and others have put together with the Diamond, uh, with the uh, Diadromous Fish Working Group uh, many years ago. And so we create the, this group, uh, Dr. Russ Burke's on it, some other people are, are on it, uh, and really provide guidance and, and uh, assistance. We have, uh, again, tried to systematically address the uh, threats that diamondback terrapins face. And one of them, well, before we've been showing this, is about direct human harvest. And back, I think it was 2017, the first step was taken to uh, uh, stop the legal harvest of diamondback terrapins for human consumption. And that did occur. There was a DEC rulemaking. And uh, uh, I think, Carl, you played a role and Russ played a role in, in implementing that. Um, and then we started focusing on dr uh, terrapins uh, drowning in crab pots. It is a huge problem along the East Coast. We have reports in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, it's still a, a very extensive problem where thousands of terrapins drown every year in crab pots. It certainly is an issue in New York State. And after several years worth of effort, we were able to convince, if you will, DEC to implement a regulation that requires uh, commercial crab pots or non-collapsible crab pots that are going to be uh, deployed, if you will, in shallow uh, waters, <clears throat> and the map that shows those areas are available online, um, be equipped with TEDs, an acronym for, acronym for uh, terrapin excluder devices. These are basically <clears throat> a one and three quarter by four and three quarter 
um, structures. Uh, the Nature Conservancy had a bunch made up, made of metal. We've bought 10,000 of them made of plastic. They get attached to the vent of a, uh, a crab pot, and by so doing, significantly reduce the number of terrapins that can get in harm's way, while with not reducing at all the impact to uh, crab catch. So it's a, a really a, a important way to try to uh, protect terrapins. Of course, road crossings can be a problem. Roads that are in the coastal areas where female terrapins, typically in June, come up out of the water to lay their eggs. Uh, Roadkill is a problem all throughout Long Island. And so we have developed these uh, signs. Uh, we've made up 100 of them. Um, happy to give them out if you know places where terrapin mortality is an issue. We have given out, I think, 12 so far that are going to be put, thank you, that are going to be put uh, up at uh, Cedar Beach in Mount Sinai where we had uh, three uh, large females killed last year, as well as other places around Long Island. Um, and you can see, again, they do really uh, find themselves in harm's way when the females come ashore to lay their eggs. This is a huge problem in New Jersey, and I just chatted with somebody recently there they're going to be addressed again in a holistic fashion. All those east-west roads that connect the Barrier Island to the mainland, they're going to be taking on every one of them. It's really quite, quite impressive and heartening what they're doing there. And we want to replicate that here. So what have we done in this with regard, besides the signs that we've had made up, we were fortunate enough to get funding from PSE&G, thank you PSE&G, um, to uh, buy 2,500 feet of this black coil tubing a very low cost but effective means to keep terrapins out of harm's way. The tubing is laid down, it's anchored in, in the ground, and female terrapins cannot get over it. So we had, again, that much footage put in at Orient Beach State Park, working with the state park officials on the north side of the main entrance road, if you know that, at Orient Beach. It's a absolutely wonderful uh, park. and. Halleck Bay just to the north, Peconic Bay to the south. It's, again, got a, a fairly large terrapin population, uh, although we'd like to better quantify that. And so this, uh, again, this tubing's been put down to uh, try to keep females out of harm's way because they have had roadkill there, as well as some box turtles. Uh, we also have put in 550 feet of this tubing at Cedar Beach at Mount Sinai in an effort to try to keep female terrapins out of parts of it. And you see, so these are the signs again. And then associated with this, we really want to put in gardens. We call them terrapin gardens. They're sandy uh, beds, typically 20 feet by 20 feet, about anywhere from about a foot to 18 inches deep of sand. If you put them on the, shall we say, the upstream side of the uh, those barriers, the females can then have a very conducive uh, 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 bed to lay their eggs in and don't get out in harm's way to try to push against that barrier. Also, there's a last little thing, a Terrapin Watch Survey. And again, you can get into uh, uh, the uh, CTOX website. You can learn more about this and uh, the survey app. But we really want to get a, a, a kind of a finer grained understanding of the distribution of terrapins on Long Island because it will help, the, for example, the, the mapping, for roadmap mortality, uh, roadkill mortality issue. So we encourage you, if you do uh, see terrapins, to please uh, download that data. It takes about 20 seconds to 30 seconds to do, and it'll help us, again, get a better understanding. And there it is, let's see. And very least, I got what, one minute, two minutes, three minutes? I got one minute, oh boy, hard to do justice. Water reuse, okay, shifting to the third gear. You clearly understand, I think, about the, um, um, water quality impacts, water management impacts as it relates to wildlife, wildlife habitat. If you don't have enough water in the aquifer system, uh, water table elevations drop and streams and lakes and ponds dry out, i.e. Nassau County. Um, if you don't treat that water well and you have quality issues, it can, uh, as Nicole had um, stated during her presentation, you can adversely impact tidal marshes and 
Therapins can die because of the uh, biotoxins they pick up, because of the algae blooms that are fueled by nitrogen. So anyway, we have decided to take on the issue of trying to reduce nitrogen, try to reduce water withdrawals through the concept of water reuse. 2.7 billion gallons of water are reused every day in the United States. Water reuse, water recycling, water reclamation, all the same thing. And <clears throat> with funding from the Green Tree Foundation, we were able to put together a report, and this is exciting reading, called the Long Island Water Reuse Roadmap and Action Plan. Um, Enrico played a key role in writing, and I contributed a little bit to it. Um, and we hired Cameron Engineering to uh, do a lot of the, kind of, shall we say, the, the grunt work. Um, and what we're trying to do is come up with this, again, a blueprint or a roadmap where we prioritize, we identify what are the opportunities where you've got sewage treatment plants, which are the source of this water, and the, the potential targets where you could use that highly reclaimed wastewater, most typically golf courses, but perhaps also sod farms, thereby taking nitrogen out of the coastal system while at the same time keeping water in the ground. And let me give you one example of that and I'll conclude. And that is you've got the Riverhead Sewage Treatment Plant where they have a, the only water reuse project, um, well not the only, but, but the, maybe the most significant water reuse project on the island where you've got the Riverhead plant, if you know where that is, um, they, that plant is adjacent to the Indian Island County Golf Course. And so they upgraded that plant a bit more, and they take that water, instead of discharging it into Peconic River slash Flanders Bay slash Peconic Bay, they send it during the warm months right next door to the golf course. That water with a little bit of nitrogen, three to four parts per million nitrogen, is what's used to fertigate or irrigate the, the golf course thereby keeping 63 million gallons of water in the ground and keeping about 1.2 tons of nitrogen out of the, the Peconic Bay at about 2%. <laughs> so imagine if we could do that all, all throughout Long Island. If you just take the 19 highest rated projects in this roadmap, which again, you could read online. I encourage you to go into CTUX website. You can read all about it. You will uh, find that. Uh, the 19 projects would keep about 22 tons of nitrogen out of Long Island's coastal waters while keeping about 700 million gallons of water in the ground, a key water management strategy that really can help address the, uh, the, the challenges that we face. On that conclusion, I, I'm gonna, Enrico, do you wanna t close out the, the day? Okay, thank you.